Hi, and welcome to the Indie Music Podcast, the podcast for independent musicians and other audio professionals. We're your hosts. I'm Matt Denton, also known as Mojo of Ragged Birds Music. I'm a Bay Area mix engineer and recording artist. And Douglas Reynolds of Resonance Mastering, a mastering engineer in Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome to Indie Music Podcast, episode 220. Tonight, Matt and Doug discuss patch bays. Doug goes into a fairly deep dive about what patch bays are, different types of connections, visualization of signal flow, and discussion of patch bay modes and how understanding these can help you determine how you can best set signal routing in your studio. Enjoy the show. Check. Double check. Sounds good on this side. Double mint gum. (laughs) I'm trying to get my gate set right. I didn't like it last time. Uh, I couldn't tell. I just noticed uh, you sounded sounded warm and fat. (laughs) (laughs) Oh. Well... Warm and fat is 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 good because that's me right now. I'm warm and fat, silky smooth, but it's eighty degrees, and I need to lose some weight. But anyway, enough about that. <laughs> but is is warm and fat like a step in the silky smooth direction? Ooh, that's a good question. I think <laughs> not. Silky smooth to me it implies a little, you know, like a thinness, a, a slenderness of audio interesting i could be wrong this is why talking about sound is so difficult it is trying to visualize you know all the stuff that we talk about i mean there's things that that are hard to explain in the medium of you know an audio podcast yeah absolutely a lot of things and and i'm i'm such a visual learner and visual person anyway it, a lot of things are kind of lost on me if I only hear it or read about it. It's also a matter of stuff that you actually use and that's or, true. or things that you're interested in to figure out if you want to use them. Will they provide some solution or make things easier in some way or better? Yeah. Perhaps. Well, I find sometimes like you can read something and it only partially makes sense. And then you learn it and you do it and you go back later and go, oh, this makes complete sense. Now I see exactly what they're talking about. I just didn't have any place to put this information. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think the doing part is key for me at least. Uh, You know, I mean, I can can read and and get some uh, fundamental understanding of things, but I don't really get it. Yeah, oftentimes until I do it, you know, and then it it kind of sinks in through um, the act of actually being involved with it. Right. Does that make you a kinesthetic learner? Because I feel like that's kind of what I where I'm at. I, I need to so. see it, but then I need to do it too. Yeah, I think as far as retaining things long term, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah. For just rote memorization, I'm not a big fan of rote memorization and. It was probably, you know, why I had to, like, in really work hard in math classes and stuff like that and go over and and, uh, work through formula after formula and do hundreds of math problems Mm -hmm. to to do well on it in the class. I really had to apply myself actively in working on examples. Yeah. Other people could read through the stuff and get that. You know, which is really neat. I, I think that's really cool. And I suppose there's some things that I'm like that in. It, it just depends on what the subject matter is. Well, it's funny. Yeah, just talking about that called up, to me, called up images of equations. So, I mean, <laughs> even with math, I was a visual learner. Like, I really enjoyed calculus and, and algebra because you can, like, you could see it. It made cool patterns on the page. And, you know, I could kind of, like, snapshot what it looks like and then recreate it. Yeah. And I did that, you know, visually I connected with geometry. I was really into that. Strangely, that one didn't, didn't do well with me, man. I really, I struggled with it. That one, that one I felt like was a lot of rote memorization more so than algebra for some reason. And yeah, I didn't do well. Of course, that was also the class that that was at the end of the day when that's not my best brain power hour. And, and I was always, you know, skipping out on class to go get on the 
the bus with the <laughs> girls' volleyball team and give them back rubs. So that was a whole <laughs> another reason I was not doing well in geometry. I got a different kind of uh, um, learning during that period of time. Was that the the beginning of your career as a as a sports massage therapist? <laughs> my brief career, my brief amateur <laughs> career. Yes. <laughs> My very brief, one semester long <laughs> stint as a as a sports massage therapist. Yeah, pretty much one season. That's that's that was about it. And that was the girls' volleyball team, right? Is oh yes, okay. it most definitely was. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your specialization. It was my specialization. Well, I was supposed to be filming them, you know, with the videotape, you know, so they could watch film later, and so that was my excuse to get out of class, but. You know, there was a bus ride, so you can't film on the bus. You got to find other things to do. <laughs> anyway, so what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about something that's really difficult to explain in a medium of an audio podcast. And I really wanted to take this on because it, I felt that it's a challenge to do that. And I would like to talk about patch based tonight. Patch based. The, patch bays. The, the patching of bays. Yes. The bay with patches. <laughs> what is a patch bay, Doug? A patch bay is a device that allows you to route a signal path in various ways and set up default routes so that you don't have to patch things that are always the way that you want them to be routed okay. and allow you to do lots of different configuration easily. And, uh, you know, changing signal paths, introducing different things into the signal path easily so that getting behind your rack or behind the desk and, and wiring different things up doesn't get in your way creatively. So you can, in a moment, go, oh, I want to bring this in to my signal chain and apply this effect to it. And maybe, maybe you're like an electronic music producer. And you've got some synths and different effects and things like that. And having to stop and get behind your desk and, and wire stuff up and, you know, uh, just blows your whole creative process, you know, when sure. in a matter of a second, you can bring in, you know, an outboard effect like a pedal or something like that into your signal chain and, and you're moving. You got that idea. You can experiment. You can try different stuff and do it in real time. So we're talking about hardware. We're talking about connecting hardware to other hardware or hardware to a computer through basically a, a, a board where you can plug cables in and out of easily to change the direction of a signal, correct? Pretty much, yeah. And it, yeah, so it's a way to get your audio signal out of your computer into outboard effects. And these can be guitar pedals or your sense or, you know... Um, whatever that you want to uh, use in, in your audio production, and then back into your computer as well, you know, and that would be via your interface. Right. It's funny. Every time I hear about patch bays, I always think of Lily Tomlin uh, in, <laughs> in the Sesame Street when she's pretending to be the operator. One ringy ding. <laughs> and she's fucking, because that's how they used to patch phone lines. You would call yeah. the operator and they would connect your phone line physically to the other phone line where you wanted to go. And uh, yeah, there, that played out very well in a lot of scenes in the series Mad Men. I don't know if you remember that, but yeah. yeah I always think of Lily Tomlin sitting there asking you, you know, where you would like your signal to be routed. Would you like it to go to your yeah. compressor? <laughs> and it's interesting if you paid close attention. You would see there was a specific type of connector that she was using to make those patches with. and I believe it was a quarter-inch uh, cable. Well, one might think so. But I was very young when I was watching Sesame yeah, Street. Yeah, well, they had a couple remember. different types. <laughs> they have one that's called a, a TT connector. Mm -hmm. And they've got another one, which is like an MI or military-grade uh, connector. But uh, um, a TT is kind of like a small... TRS. It's a little bit. A TRS, a quarter inch, if you were to put it into a TT input, uh, you would damage it. Oh. Because it's just a little bit bigger than the TT. Standards are good. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> overall patch bays are kind of, a, they're pretty simple. And 
um, and I'll get into it in a little bit. The, the main thing is understanding the modes of patch bays, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But just just know that in order to really effectively use patch bays, you need to understand the mode of the patch bay that you're using. And some patch bays allow you to have multiple modes. But in essence, a patch bay is used to connect one piece of equipment to another. That's in its simplest explanation. And if you understand the modes and how to how the patch bay works internally is basically what that is that will allow you to then visualize how your signal flows through and how you can tap into that signal and reroute it to other places and things like that. So I assume this is different than a guitar uh, than a, than a, a mode that you would play. On a yeah, guitar. right, right. So yes, yeah, we're gonna go with the Dorian patch bay today. The Dorian and, patch bay. Yeah, we might move into Mixolydian patch. Yeah, bays. I like the Mixolydian patch, <laughs> patch bay. I find it very versatile. But typically in a in a professional studio now, barring there's new digital routing processors that do this too. Okay, and you can bring in. Lots of channels into a digital mastering processor or something like that, or in a mm-hmm. router. And you can just say, I want to organize my signal flow and bring, I want this compressor first or this EQ. And then I want to route it over to whatever effects processor. And then we're going to bring it back in. And you can change that with button presses and just organize the, uh, uh, the routing. I actually have something like this for my guitar. Um, which is a, it's a boss effects routing pedal board. You know, it's a, a pedal switcher okay, and, yeah. and you can program the routes in. So you can plug all your effects into whatever channel you want. You've got a distortion in channel one and an EQ in channel two and a phaser in channel three or whatever, but you don't have to have them in that order. You can tell it that I want to have, uh, you know, distortion phaser, and then EQ, and then route back out to the amp or whatever order that you want your signal flow to go in. So it's really convenient. You hook it up once and then you can you can change however you want just through button pushes in that case. And if you imagine something like that, if you're familiar with something like that, well, imagine rather than button pushes that you have some patch cables (laughs) and those and where you plug those patch cables in is where you're getting signal from and where you're taking it to. And it's that simple. Okay. And so it doesn't have to be a complex thing to think about and to, to kind of grasp the idea of it. And again, when we get to the modes, that's really where it's at because that the modes of a, of a, a patch bay determine what happens when you plug something in. But anyway, in a professional studio, you will find patch bays and whether it be all outboard or hybrid and involving some kind of outboard hardware gear. Yes, it's a patch bays are related to hardware, but everything will be connected through the patch bay, except perhaps mic preamps. Those can, but you would want to have a, probably have a patch bay that's dedicated to your mic pre's. And one of the reasons for that is phantom voltage. Because oh, you wouldn't right. want to accidentally introduce phantom voltage into your expensive compressor, for instance. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, now, you can certainly do it. You need to know and understand the modes of the patch bay and how everything is connected in order to do that to ensure that you never make that mistake of introducing phantom voltage. You know, you can put 48 volts into something in, and that's a bad day. So Right. But it's not really recommended. So. Uh, you know, I would I would suggest not running mic preamps in the same patch bay that you're running others. Although it's extremely convenient to have a patch bay for your mic pre's because then you can have all of your inputs on the back of your rack and and you don't ever have to go there. You can plug everything in from the front and that makes it really convenient to to run your microphones, to hook up cables, and do everything and you know and uh, and work from the the front of your console and area and stuff like that. So yeah, I would think definitely that would be nice a to have. Advantage. Just got to be real careful. And I also would imagine that one of the most important things when you're talking about patch bays would be color coding. <laughs> yeah, my patch bay I don't have any labeling on yet, um, but what I do have is a color coded spreadsheet that 
maps out everything for me. And I just have that up on my on my monitor and I can uh, flip to that window real quick and have a look at my diagram when I need to, you know. I mean, I know my patch parade pretty well, so it, uh, uh, it it's just a matter of if I, at the moment, I'm like, hey, which, you know, which channel is, uh, is that EQ in or something like that, but. Right. But yeah, you don't but, want to be doing a whole lot of trial and error. Is it this one? No, nah, you know, because if you don't have a map and then you don't remember, then that means you're getting into the back and you've, you're going and following cables around to figure out what goes where, you know, and nobody wants to do that. So just map that stuff out and document it when you're doing it and then update it when you change anything. And that'll make your life better, you know, down the road. But yeah, but anyway, so the patch bay allows you to quickly connect different pieces of gear together. And you don't have to crawl behind and run cables from one unit to the other and stuff like that. So there's, it's hugely convenient. And as I mentioned, it removes a block, a creative block for having to do that kind of thing and mess with cables when all you want to do is, is I wonder how this will sound if I bring in this distortion unit or something like that, you know? Well, yeah, any friction you can remove between you and the creative process. And we talked to before about how getting bogged down in technical stuff whether it's having to get your guitar out of the, a case or whether it's having to download software updates. I mean, anything that gets in the way of your creative processes is uh, best removed if possible. So, yeah. So a patch bay, we're still kind of way up here in the 10,000 foot area of patch bays, but it, <laughs> it's a series of input and output sockets. Okay. And in a typical patch bay, it's organized in two rows of, Let's let's just keep it simple, and we'll we'll use a quarter inch patch bay with balanced inputs. So it's, they're TRS. You can get unbalanced connectors and patch bays, but why? Because you can run a TS into a TRS, and it'll still work. But in this case, let's keep it simple. We'll talk about TRS. I already talked about TT, which is just like a TRS. It's just a different size, and there's also XLR patch bays, you know, for that matter. So, but anyway, we'll just keep it to TRS for visual simplicity. And TRS and, is tip ring sleeve. It's basically, it looks like a stereo jack. It's got, yeah, you know, it's a usually a quarter inch plug, like a guitar cable, but it has um, an extra little black line separating a second section. So you have tip ring sleeve. Yeah. Each, each carrying. And what that a, is, it's, some, it's using a quarter inch connector, mm -hmm. which is balanced. Okay, so it's like you can interchange a TRS and an XLR as balanced connectors. So, you know, it just depending on if you're running from, like, it, I have a lot of cabling that's going from XLR to TRS into the back of the patch bay. Mm -hmm. We ground. And so the wiring configuration is works directly with XLR connectors. Uh, you can wire them directly from one end to the other, no problem. But so balanced connection and sometimes in the, in the rear of some patch base, they have what's called a, like a DB25 or a D sub connectors. And that's, mm -hmm. that'll typically be like a 25 pin connector that, that goes out to create eight output channels. So you could have like three D sub connectors on the back and actually have 24 channels coming out of those three connectors. Um, and those are, it's to save space. So when you have lots of channels, you, you sure. might have maybe a TRS on the front, but D subs on the back or something like that. But anyway, in some patch base, it's all solder connections on the back and you have to go through and basically solder all of your connections together yourself. Really? Yeah. That sounds like a pain in the butt. Yeah. Um, but that goes to show you that once you're wired up, there's not a whole lot that necessarily changes often on the backside unless you remove gear or you're adding new gear once you're in you're typically don't have to mess with the back of the patch bay so typically patch bays will have like 24 channels with an io for each channel so you've got a total of 48 patch points and these patch points will be organized in in two rows and 24 columns okay mm -hmm. and each column is is an IO. And we want to talk about a convention right off the bat here. This is important for understanding the signal flow. And that is that the top row is always your outputs. So 
whatever gear that you are plugging into the back of the patch bay, the output of that gear is going to go into the top or the first row, the top row of the patch bay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the inputs are always going to go into the bottom row, into the back of the patch bay. Okay. So that means output, anything coming out of a piece of equipment is going to be in the top. And anything going into a piece of equipment is going to go into the bottom of the two rows on the patch bay. Okay. That makes sense. And that's a convention. You can do it the other way, but you, again, you have to understand the modes, which we'll get into in a little bit. But, but if you went into anywhere, they had a patch bay, this convention is in place for a reason so that you don't have to question that. You don't have to know that. So it's good practice to follow that convention and, and keep outputs on the top and inputs on the bottom. Imagine when we're thinking about outputs and inputs, then we're looking at the back of the patch bay. Okay, so outputs mm-hmm. are on the top, inputs are on the bottom. So the signal flow is going out toward the front of the patch bay on the top, and the signal flow is going in through the back of the patch bay and back to your equipment inside your rack on the bottom, if that makes sense. So, so you think about it like signal flowing downhill from the top to the bottom. Yeah, they often call it like a waterfall. <laughs> Huh, there you go. Yeah. And so the signal flows like water from the top to the bottom. That's easy to remember. Yeah. With that in mind, then you need to remember, it's important to remember that the signal should never flow from the output of a device and immediately be routed back into its input. Mm, so th- that would be like you came out of the output of your distortion pedal and took the cable and went immediately back into the input of the same distortion pedal. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't want to ever do that. Any small disturbance would cause a a feedback loop, okay? And you may not hear it in that case because it's not going anywhere. But let's say if if you had an outboard compressor or something like that and you went from its output back into its input, you would watch your, your VU meter get pegged in a matter of seconds from the, the feedback loop that's occurring inside that device. Right. So keep that in mind. Your outputs should never route directly back into the inputs of the same device. Your signal should always flow from an output somewhere else before it comes back in. Mm-hmm. So I guess this is where we'll talk about the topologies of patch bays. A topology or typology is their mode. Okay. And these are defined by their type of normalization keyword all right so normaling let's consider that your that your studio gear has default routes and that means that hey i'm going to come out of my interface so it comes out of my computer goes into my interface via usb or whatever and then i've got um, a digital analog converter and that converter is going to give me some analog outputs okay and so i'm going to take an analog output left and right and those are going to go into the top of two of the channels on my patch bay, okay? And so I have a left out and a right out on my patch bay. And then I always want to have my compressor, for instance, plugged into the input of my compressor connected to the output of my, of my DA converter's analog out. So that signal from my DA is always going to flow directly into my uh, compressor by default. If I don't change anything, that's the signal route that I always want, okay? It could be Mm -hmm. whatever. If you have something that you want to be that way 99% of the time, then then you'll want to create that as a default route. And you can do that with patch base. So normaling is what we're talking about. And it provides a means of creating such a default connection. And, And there are, I guess this is probably the most important thing to grasp. So you can really understand the power and versatility of a patch bay. So I can't stress that enough here that there's, there's three basic types of normally, and there's full normal, half normal, and (laughs) non-normal or Abby normal. I'm definitely a non-normal. Yeah. (laughs) And each one of these types, each one of these modes is defined by how the signal passes through the patch bay channel when cables are connected to it. Okay. And that's not how it passes from one the cable in the back to the cable in the front per se it's how the it's how the signal actually behaves 
inside the patch bay card itself, okay? Hmm. And how that signal behaves inside the patch bay card itself determines what happens when you when you plug things into it in different ways, okay? So let's talk about the normal, normal normalization. The normal type of connection allows a signal to pass from the outputs to the inputs without the need for any type of cable connection in the front of the patch bay, all right? Hmm. So that means when I was talking about defaults, like having a default route, Without doing anything on the front of the patch bay, if I plugged my outputs of my DA into the top two channels, one and two of my patch bay, and then the inputs of my compressor into the bottom two channels, one and two, then by default, without any wires or cables on the front, my output from the DA is always going to go to the input of my compressor. Okay? Yep. And that's a default route. That makes sense. Yeah. Quick question. Is there any, is it straight pass through or is there any any power inside the patch bay that uh, there's probably more than one kind, but I'm thinking um, that would kind of keep the signal level across so that there's no loss. You're kind of of thinking about buffering or something like that. Yeah. 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 Probably mine isn't uh, buffered. I, my guitar pedal router is, Every channel on my guitar pedal router has buffering on it. And I I have not worked with the patch bay that has buffering in it, though. Mm. Most of the ones that I've ever seen or, or the one that I own is passive. So it's it has no power at all. And I think with balanced connections, it's really not an issue. Yeah. If you're looking at unbalanced, then you're going to have you're going to have things like capacitance and resistance and things like that that really come into play once you get a, a long run of cable and those connections all add up, you know? And yeah, I guess that's what I was thinking of, that there would be some kind of signal loss yeah. depending but on how with, many things you had plugged with balance in. balance connections, this, you've got, rather than, what is it, 16, 16 feet, 8 inches of cable before you have signal degradation in a guitar cable, unbalanced or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got a hundred feet or something like that in in balance connections. So yeah, it's really not something to be concerned with and if you're using balanced connections and balanced cables. Yeah, that makes sense. Just curious. Yeah. So so we have a default connection there that I was talking about. And right. And that doesn't require anything. However, you can break that default connection and you do that when you plug something in. And this is where the different modes vary. So the normal, half normal, and non-normal behave differently when you uh, when you plug stuff into them. And by default, without anything plugged into them, they can be different as well. Half normal and normal are, are, more, are more similar than, you know, to each other than non-normal is to those two. But still talking about uh, normal patch bay connections, the signal can be, uh, or that signal path, that default signal path can be broken. And in a normal type, if you plug a patch cable into the front in either the top or the bottom, you break that default signal flow. Okay. Mm. And so that means if I plug something in the top of the output of, of that signal, it's no longer going to my compressor. I plug one into my, my cable in there. The signal's now in my hand getting ready to go somewhere else so that the the un, you know the tip of the other end of that patch cord is where my signal is now right and it's not going anywhere else until i patch it and so i just uh, created a dead end for that signal and so then i can route that instead of going to my compressor I, i'm going to go over to the input of my eq i want to run my eq first in this case okay i can go into my eq and then back out of my eq and then into the compressor which is by default going back to the DA. So with two patch cords, I've just rerouted the signal to go to the the EQ, then to the compressor, and then back. If I had to do that without a patch bay, I would have had the two cables for the DA to unplug from the compressor and and go to the EQ, two more cables from the EQ to go back to the compressor, and then two more cables to go from the output of the compressor back to the interface, okay? So I did all that routing changes simply with with two patch cables in the front of the bay. And even with a simple example like that involving two, you can see that the number of cables that I had to mess with was 
dramatically reduced in order to achieve what I wanted to do with it, you know? So anyway, it allows you to really effectively and quickly reroute your chain path um, in any way that you would like to. But you need to understand that with normal, once you plug into the top or bottom, you've broken the, the signal flow. So either if you grab the output or if you plug something else into the input, you're going to break that flow. The signal from the from the top's no longer going to flow back, you know, from like, in this case, the DA to the compressor. If you plug into the input, you've broken that default connection. Now, whatever's going into the input is going to the compressor and nothing else. Half normal is a little bit different, even though it's pretty much exactly the same as normal, but it has one distinct difference. And that is when you insert a cable in either output or input breaks a default signal flow in a normal connection type, only inserting it into the input point or the bottom of the half normal connection breaks the flow. So that means you can have basically kind of like a Y cable. You plug into the output and your signal is still being routed to the default connection in the back to the input of your compressor, for example. And in your hand, you've got a duplicate copy of the signal that you can route elsewhere. So you basically can monitor at that output point if you want to, or you can take that and reroute it somewhere else for parallel processing. So you can have the original signal going into two different effects to be summed somewhere later. And this is called molting. Okay, it's, and it's useful for inserting monitoring, like I said. Um, you could set up parallel processing, like I said. Um, and in any of those cases, the signal continues to travel down the default path while the molted signal is routed to a different destination. But if you plug into the bottom, into the input, you break the connection. It's just like the normal type of patch bay connection. And now you only have one copy of the signal and whatever's coming back into uh, that input is what it's getting processed into your compressor in this case that's in the back. And then the last one is non-normal, okay? And unlike both normal and half normal, non-normal never has a default flow. So this is really good for that situation where you never want the output to go back in the input. So this would be a good way to have your outputs of your DA coming out of the top row of channel one and two, and the inputs going back into your DA being in the bottom row of channels one and two of the patch bay as well, because those are never going to be connected together um, by default in the patch bay. You'd actually have to run a patch cable from channel one top to channel one bottom in order to make that flow that you'd never want to have. So you can grab the output, send it wherever you want, bring it back in the input to complete your signal path. So hopefully those modes made sense. We have normal, half normal, and non-normal. And if you understand those modes, then understanding how to route signal and use your patch bay is a lot easier, more intuitive, and you can really leverage the uh, power and flexibility of a patch bay. Kind of to conclude, patch bays allow you to create default connections, and they can do that without requiring any additional cable connections. Normal and half normal types allow you to break connections and create new routes by using patch cables from the front of the patch bay. Non-normal patch bays prevent default routes, allowing you to stack connections that you do not want to be routed directly together. Patch bays allow instant creative freedom to try different routing configurations, all the while maintaining a default configuration to return to. In every case, modifications of routing uh, eliminates the need to get into the back of your rack to change cable configurations. So this is, as we said, beneficial for just spontaneity and creativity and changing your signal path and bringing in different effects and experimentation and creation. So to ask, do you need a patch bay? Well, that's something that you'll need to decide for yourself and determined by do you have outboard gear? Do you have a need for modification of your signal path? And do you have complex routing scenarios? And if you feel your creative flow is often blocked in your current setup, then perhaps looking at how being able to reroute cable connections using a patch bay might help solve that creative block. So anyway, 
hopefully, Matt, that makes sense and gave you a good idea of how patch bays are really cool. Yep, you certainly did, Doug. Very cool. So there you have it. Everything that you ever wanted to or never knew you wanted to know about patch bays. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Indie Music Podcast. Please like and subscribe, share with your friends, or just leave us a review on iTunes if you like what you've heard. Find our social links and episode guide at IndieMusicCast.com. Until next time, keep creating.